Hello, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Joel Garami. I'm the medical director for the Vascular Ultrasound Lab, and I would like to welcome you on our monthly uh, uh, webinar um, of the Vascular Ultrasound Masterclass. Uh, today, uh, we're going to talk about the vertebral artery disease, um, and again, we just cannot separate the vertebral artery uh, from subclavian, so we'll cover both. Um, if you have any questions, please go to a website, pollev.com, and enter DeBakey. Uh, or if you would like to submit your questions on the phone, just text uh, DeBakey to uh, 37607. So text DeBakey to 37607. Um, and uh, between uh, cases, um, Hopefully we'll have like two or three times when we can review those questions. Um, also, I want you to mark your calendar uh, for June 11. Uh, we're going to do a TCD uh, masterclass. Uh, we'll cover TCD and carotid. Uh, we had too many requests about uh, TCD. Uh, we did not cover uh, enough TCD material when we did our vascular masterclass. So we would like to do this um, as a separate uh, masterclass. So, uh, one of my motivation uh, why I wanted to talk about the vertebral uh, disease, uh, when we look at the vertebral basilar insufficiencies, TIs and stroke, it's kind of stunning that it's, it's a different disease than when we talk about the carotid and stroke. So 60% of these uh, patients uh, without any uh, warning TI, they may have a stroke. This is what we learned from the New England uh, registry. And what's interesting is that I believe that the carotid and the TCD combination should be a kind of gold standard. Um, when we do uh, other imaging modality, um, again, we don't have that dynamic assessment. There is more static assessment, and I believe the carotid TCD give us more functional and hemodynamic assessment of this uh, vessel. So um, uh, when you compare MRI, uh, MRA uh, versus duplex, uh, definitely there is a sensitivity issue, but uh, don't forget that when you're laying down on your MR, you're just kind of laying down, you don't turn your head, and sometimes just the head turn is enough to really provoke symptoms. That's why I believe uh, that those uh, head turning maneuvers kind of really helpful for the vertebral basilar disease. And again, when you're going through, uh, we do have certain set parameters when we uh, measure the velocities, but I think the idea here is we're gonna teach you and we want you to think about and talk the same language like we do, uh, in the Doppler language, what are the different abnormal v, uh, vertebral waveforms? And again, based on the waveforms, uh, we can definitely predict proximal versus distal disease. Uh, this is one of my favorite image, how a lateral projection NGO kind of compared to a TCD, because again, the TCD image shows you the intracranial part, uh, how the vertebral enters uh, into the skull. Uh, this is what you see here. And then uh, from 60 to 110, the entire thing is blue. So telling you the signal going away from your signal, uh, from your probe, I'm sorry. So this is where uh, the vertebral basilar on the TCD just kind of will be on one uh, single uh, image and you can just change the depth by listening to a different spectrum and a different speed. Um, and I think it's very important that we believe the vertebral basilar, again, despite these little small vessels, they are play a very important role in collateralization of the uh, anterior circulation of the brain. Uh, these are just uh, nice uh, literature review, so special thanks to my fellow Jonathan. Um, uh, he uh, digged out this reference uh, where we believe that, uh, again, 88% specificity, you will see for more than 50% uh, uh, stenosis. And what we think on the subclavian values of 240, uh, despite of 240, we are using 200 uh, based on a different reference. But definitely uh, the subclavian and the carotid uh, and the vertebral disease, we cannot uh, kind of separate. And definitely when we are talking about subclavian, we need to see uh, at least 15 or uh, we're using a 20 mercury millimeter pressure difference between the two arm uh, blood pressures. And again, this is the example why uh, the value is not important or it just cannot help. So here the velocity uh, is about uh, uh, 90. 
So there's nowhere close to the 240 or 200, but this delayed systolic upstroke is telling me there's definitely a disease. And when you look at the vertebral abnormal waveform, that's kind of confirming there's a definitely a subclavian disease. So this is why um, I think it's like the vertebral a little bit ignored. Uh, certain centers may not even including as a part of the carotid protocol. Our centers uh, really, uh, we fight it uh, like over six months uh, every uh, weekly meeting to figure out what's the proper uh, way of uh, uh, doing a carotid protocol and we decided that we'll have a vertebral and at the end of the uh, carotid protocol and right after that we'll have a subclavian artery and this is where uh, we believe that uh, we are capturing everything on the cervical part and again TCD will help us to really add the intracranial part. Uh, when you look at MR there's a cervical, there's an intracranial part but again the skull base is something that what with ultra sound we really definitely uh, uh, investigating best. So when you look at the um, hypoplastic versus a blunted signals and this is an intracranial duplex we'll talk more about it and this blunted signal tells you there is an obstruction proximal to that. So this is where it's important the waveform also tells you distal versus proximal disease but in this case the blunted signal tells you that my systolic upstroke is disappeared and between my measurement point and the heart there somewhere there's an obstruction. So we believe that uh, the, by values and comparison, definitely there's an asymmetry between the two vertebrals um, uh, and we call it 25%. And I think my next slide is gonna give you like 70% uh, uh, of the vertebrals are definitely bigger on the left side. So um, that is a very important finding. And one more, just uh, a reminder that my brachiocephalic uh, uh, trunk is gonna be on the right side, giving you a co uh, common origin for your carotid uh, and the vertebral system. So this is where the uh, coincidence uh, uh, is uh, rare on the right side, but why on the left side, an abnormal vertebral waveform and a subclavian is not gonna be a, a, a common origin uh, disease. And again, uh, sometimes we miss the anatomy when we said 46% uh, coming from the aorta. Here's one case we saw uh, with Dr. Diaz and Dr. Klasnik that uh, the vertebral artery is originate from the internal carotid artery and give you the basilar and the PCAs. And here's the carotid gonna give you the MC and ACA. And again, with the significant disease, there was a stent uh, placed. And it's almost, I call it a double bifurcation that you see the ECA and here's your vertebral basilar system. And uh, you're not gonna see this picture in, in, in not even in the books. There is drawing about how the persistent hypoglossal artery look like. So uh, do a screenshot really fast. So this is your persistent hypoglossal artery so when a vertebral originates from the ICA. So it's kind of funny, uh, first uh, when we started to do these slides, we said uh, there's a four segments of the uh, vertebral artery, but the zero is your origin. So definitely it will make it five. Um, and definitely the most uh, frequently visited uh, uh, is the V2. So we definitely, uh, on a carotid protocol, if you have a normal V2, we are not going to investigate the V0, uh, but definitely this is something that uh, we should, if you have an abnormal finding in V2, try to go more proximal. Uh, and addition to the carotid, uh, the TCD is going to investigate the V4 uh, segment. So this is the combination of the uh, two tests uh, will kind of give you a very good assessment throughout the whole vertebral uh, system. So this is just one of those gorgeous image when you have a vein and the artery going to opposite direction. There's no argument again. Uh, you need to look at your reference, your color scale. So always want to tell that the head is on this side. That vertebral definitely goes to that direction. And again, it's different color than your vein. So even if you're colorblind, uh, please uh, try to look at the positive. It's going to uh, go with the positive uh, Doppler shift here. Um, and again, uh, the asymmetry between the two vertebrals are quite common. 
These are just a couple of waveforms, and, and I think this is uh, one of the waveforms I, I wanted to show you that uh, quite, there was a mistake when one of the uh, interpret uh, thing doctor called this as a re uh, retrograde uh, uh, vertebral, just because again you used to see the red blue red blue with the same color scale, but again the rhombus is the, is in a different angle correction. So again this vertebral is diving, and this is a proper angle correction. But again uh, this is just uh, it's not inverted here. Should be inverted probably here to really help to uh, have a proper direction. But again sometimes the indirect evidence just use the indirect evidence that maybe my vein is going to a different direction and you see the artery and a vein and the same tracing and again here's a beauty uh, when the vein and the artery goes to the same uh, direction again but there's no diastolic flow so this is my to and fro with, with marks and occlusion so in this case it's very important that uh, this is not a non-patent uh, vertebral and we just need to figure out which direction is the uh, 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 the blue uh, goes, that gives you the direction that tells you that proximal probably not open, but distally open. So distal vertebral from the brain is stealing some flow to keep this vessel open all the way to the V2 part. So uh, when we are investigating, um, again, we do the blood pressure, or we check the pulse, and again, uh, the sonographer is behind the patient head. And we added one more uh, safety that with a common carotid uh, artery direction, will compare the vertebral artery direction. So if you're confused with the color box, uh, you're not gonna uh, make that mistake. Very important is this waveform that we're going to talk uh, about the same uh, shape and the same uh, uh, waveform. And when we see this is like a rabbit ear, uh, I will show you a rabbit in a second, but this is, for example, our pre steel. So the hyperemia test, we're going to uh, introduce you to hyperemia test is very important for us for proper diagnosis. And when it's uh, the retrograde vertebral is totally reversed, then you need to see a high resistance pattern. The high resistance pattern confirming that it's not feeding the brain, but it's going to feed the arm. And this is a must-read uh, paper in the JVU. I think it's a 2020 edition, and uh, they revisited the issue. And this is where you see the pre-steel alternating waveform and a complete steel, or I just call it the rectory vertebral artery. Uh, these would be the proper term to use when you would like to describe uh, these different waveforms. And these are my favorites, and I cannot tell you the reference for this. Uh, it was a pediatric journal that I saw that from a nice anterograde vertebral artery and just a V-shape cut out in systole, and all the way to the retrograde uh, vertebral, these are the different uh, stages. Uh, depends on the stenosis proximally, the vertebral waveform will be different. And again, if the blood pressure is the same, it's not subclavian disease. Blood pressure is different than the subclavian disease resulting in an, uh, an abnormal waveform in the vertebral. That's uh, how we try to approach it. And then we'll do the hyperemia next. But again, this is just a V-shape cutout. So maybe it's a 50, 70% subclavian or origin vertebral uh, disease. When it's alternating, there's a, a systole again going uh, no, towards the arm and only a diastole going blue and very interesting that this double waveform it's kind of the two vertebrae so close to each other that you see the feeding other vertebral artery in the background so the strong signal red blue red blue red blue that's representing an alternating waveform and hopefully we are not missing it when we're crossing the zero line it's easy to tell that this is abnormal I think we're quite frequently missing the anterograde but abnormal uh, uh, waveform uh, in, the, in our vertebral uh, studies. And when you see the alternating signal, when it's crossing the zero line, I think you will pay attention more than able to uh, pick up uh, that uh, disease. And when it's in the, and the vertebra is totally retrograde, uh, this is probably when you have total occlusion of the subclavian and there's no uh, diastolic flow coming into great fashion. The entire flow is retrograde. So it is high resistance and red. 
So from blue to go to red, you also see an M mode part that became more intermittent of the signal. Why you see it's more continuous when it's blue. And in this case, again, you see the both vertebral artery. You see the low resistance vertebral artery going towards the head and the high resistance retrograde artery going towards the arm. And again, an M mode captures both and an M mode shows you the continuous M mode as well as an intermittent M mode signal as well. So this would be the most important slide, um, I would say, for my talk. But again, uh, with just a little bit of zoo, just to show you how you need to see those rabbit ears when you see these waveforms. Um, uh, for some reason, I think uh, even uh, we, uh, I, uh, my family had a, uh, a rabbit as a family pet. I think it's dearly lovely. And when you look at those ears, uh, you can really see that why we love these waveforms so much. So this is again just a few examples of the V-shaped cutout. Again, it would be an antigrade flow, but it's abnormal waveform. And these are different shape and form. So V-shaped cutout, these are alternating. This is where it's really hard to see that why the person is inverted this one. Um, and another hard one is because in the diastole still want to show in a, in a good direction. So I would invert this waveform uh, to leave the uh, diastole uh, to towards the head and then great way and um, usually I don't want to say uh, never ever because here is an ICA with alternating waveform I thought for a long time that when we see these alternating waveforms in a vertebral and uh, subclavian well here's an example that you can see it as well in the ICA uh, but again, these are just different stations uh, of, uh, of different stages of the disease based on that uh, one slide. And again, uh, one is probably not artery. How I'm kind of fighting over this one because it's a different uh, uh, positivity here and there. So that's giving me a potential venous waveform. But all the rest, again, uh, these are different stage, uh, stages of the disease and these are coming from different patients as well. So back to my favorite TCD signal. So red, high resistance, blue, continuous towards the head. So this is the two difference of, the, uh, of those uh, signals. And again, my favorite hyperemia test that you need to pump the blood pressure cuff over your systole and quickly remove it. So not deflating it, but just quickly uh, remove it. And this way you're able to uh, uh, see that. Uh, and when you have a subclavian disease, you need to see the shape of the waveform is changing. So here comes a uh, high resistance retrograde flow and this is the hyperemia part. Then it has a little bit of hold, almost like generate an extra heartbeat here. But this low resistance pattern uh, kind of give you uh, the idea of how you see the changes uh, of uh, that uh, uh, vessel. And underneath, this is probably the other vertebral again. So hyperemia test, uh, again, just one of those uh, really easy to perform and really just uh, see the effect on the waveform. If you don't see the effect on the waveform, then it's a vertebral disease. So that's uh, one of the reasons how we use the, the hyperemia test. Um, here's again from the V-shape uh, cutout. In a moment, we uh, remove the uh, cup. You see that it th goes the retrograde fashion for a moment. And then it goes back to, to the regular uh, just a V-shaped cutout form, but again, a change in a waveform. That's that's my positive hyperemia test. So a little bit more on the direction because I think uh, on the cervical and the intracranial part, we really need to understand when you have. Try to use the same scale so you're not confusing yourself when you see the right and the left side. And again, how you see the low resistance and extremely high resistance where there's no diastolic flow at all. So in this case, you can probably bet that this is just not stenotic, but it's an occluded uh, subclavian with a retrograde vertebral artery. So this is an occlusion. So when you don't see diastolic flow at all, it means to and fro flow signal, to and fro. And with that uh, signal, uh, you're going to uh, able to detect an occlusion. And this is where you see the occlusion signal and kind of give you a clue that this will open if it's red, because this means it's coming towards you. If it would be a distal occluded, that would be blue 
blue, so that's where the direction almost gives you an idea uh, where the obstruction is again where by the duplex. You may not see these vessels, but intracranially you can identify the exact location of that obstruction. Um, with a sector probe, with a duplex, you can capture, and this is again a, a retrograde uh, flow now, because my probe is in the suboccipital area and the red is coming towards my probe, blue is going away from my probe. And uh, just one more uh, beautiful example for this. So here's my probe, uh, submandibular, and there's a, a stenosis. So the stenosis is uh, seen uh, on the MR, a and is right there and this is a dissection and uh, this is the danger of having a nice massage uh, so here the M mode shows you the same velocity but another hint is that you I left the scale the same way how the velocity extremely dropped so same scale here the end diastolic is like 200 and then you see this with the same scale how much the velocity drops throughout that severe stenosis so this is again uh, same uh, scale same depth so from 46 I just went to 70 meaning from here I jumped to 70 so the uh, depth uh, to the Basler that would be 80 so this is why I know that my blue signal kind of translating into an image that is coming from the from the depth of 70 here's another comparison that how the duplex also shows you the disease and you see the post stenotic dilatation here and um, again just the duplex versus a Doppler that's uh, one of my favorite image that again both of them is zero angle correction. The both duplex and the TCD going to give you the same uh, velocity reading. Again, here's your end diastolic velocity of 200, same scale on both. And because uh, there was a bilateral uh, vertebral disease, your Basler signal is blunted. So we stented one side, another side, uh, it just healed itself. And three weeks later, we have gorgeous systolic upstroke in the vertebrals as well in the basler so i think that is another beauty to see that the vertebral is no longer has a stenotic signal but you have a normal vertebral signal with a systolic upstroke this is just shows you the extra cranial and the intracranial part of how the vertebral is turning um, again around the foramen magnum how it enters the red and the blue part and here is the basler the basler compared to the previous blunted signal now you see a beautiful systolic upstroke and now you know that that stenosis this is again pre and post stenting is definitely improved and the improvement is in the systolic upstroke so by velocity sure this is a severe stenosis but i think when you detail uh, the waveform and the basler blunted signal with a beautiful systolic upstroke now you know that between your measurement point and the heart there's no obstruction anymore and why we love the hemodynamic assessment here's an example of a subclavian occlusion with a bypass and uh, what we do is we put the lift up your arm. PCA monitoring and the gentleman lift up the arm anything? and the PCA becomes it, flat it, our head get lighter and lighter mm -hmm. and lighter yeah. put your arm down and by lifting the arm he is reporting the same time the dizziness and this is how we can provoke the exam and we can see immediately that that flow change what's the result in this gentleman's symptoms so again uh, he is definitely pointing out uh, and we just need to listen where we can see the correlation with the blood flow and when he feels the symptoms so what we did again with the NGO uh, keeping the arm down you wouldn't see the difference and what you see is when we uh, repeated angio with the arm up, you see how the vertebral artery has a different op opacification. And we measured the uh, mean turns in time from here. It was like uh, two um, seconds, and here was 2.5. So that half a second's delay giving a slowing of the flow and word that kink at the origin, this is what we need to uh, stand to able to improve that flow. And uh, one of my last uh, introductory slides before we go to uh, review more cases.
Um, I just would like to show you how the waveform in the middle cerebrator is changing when we're stenting a brachiocephalic uh, stenosis. You see the stent placed with a balloon. You see the shower coming up. And when you deflate the, the balloon, you see immediately the waveform change. So that waveform change confirms that you successfully placed that stent and an immediate improvement and the signal uh, not disappearing tells us that even that tiny uh, microembolized signals, uh, microembolized, uh, they did not obstruct my MCA and they just passed through, uh, through the capillary system. So after this quick review, uh, I would like to show you some interesting cases. Um, the first case um, is going to be a 77-year-old uh, gentleman, and uh, the indication was a carotid disease. And this is my right side protocol. Start with the cross section with the color box. Uh, I would definitely would decrease my color box, so focus on the carotid and don't see all those bleeding artifacts. And here comes the first shocking image. The proximal CCA has no systolic upstroke, and the mid CCA is like, uh, I wouldn't even call this blunted, almost like non pulsatile. So, totally, um, the positivity is, is gone. And this is indicating that, again, between your measurement point and the heart, definitely there is a big obstruction. Interesting that in a bulb, we don't see too much disease, just mild uh, plaques. And the velocity is not increased, but the shape of the waveform tells us that there's a significant proximal disease here. Um, no increased velocities, and we follow it all the way on the right side. And then here's my distal ICA flow pattern. and. Just one more view of the bulb with the minimal disease, and my ECA is definitely not high resistance. So this is a low resistance ECA. But what I see here is I almost see the tiny, tiny uh, rabbit ears. So the ECA waveform shows that what we usually we see in the vertebral artery. I see the rabbit right there. I hope you guys see it with me as well. So let's do the left side. And the left side, um, I'm sorry. I think I missed that one. So before we go to the left side, um, here comes your subclavian. And the subclavian has uh, the V-shape cut out here. And here is my uh, retrograde uh, vertebral artery. So again, uh, we have the uh, non pulsatile right uh, carotid system. Uh, you have an abnormal low resistance waveform in ECA, which is indicating proximal disease as well. And then we have a retrograde vertebral uh, on the right side. So let's see what the left side is doing. And here's one more clip just to confirming the direction of the vertebral with the direction of the carotid. You see lots of collateral with the segments coming in. But we follow the vertebral a little bit more proximal. In our protocol, we also include a flow volume for the carotid system. That's just helping us with bilateral disease, uh, which side we need to fix first. So a normal value for the flow volume would be like 350, 400. You can see that this is only a 100 cc per minute going up on this carotid. Left side. The left side is gorgeous waveforms. So the left side uh, does not have proximal disease. But I want you to remember my proximal mid-CCA because we need a ratio on the left side, sadly. So it's about 100. And when you see uh, there is a, a little bit of increased velocity in the distal mid-CCA, but it's less than 50% stenosis. Um, in a bulb, an proximal ICA, there is a disease here. And I think on a grayscale, uh, you can see that. But when you see the color, I think the color shows you the flow disturbance right there. And that flow disturbance is this is where we see the velocity definitely going to be increased. And this is, again, generating an uh, easy uh, um, over 70% uh, uh, stenosis. So interesting enough, when you have that uh, under 100, but 350. And I think our ratio, actually, it's less than four. So may just going to call it 50 to 69%. 
but here we have now over 230 and over 100 and even my ratio is under four uh, two out of the three criteria matching so I would call it uh, over 70 percent uh, stenosis 70 to 99 and interesting, and this is a good uh, hint, again, for the surgeons that, again, is not a bulb, but it's a little bit more like a centimeter distal from the bulb and the origin of the IC. This is a little bit more unusual location uh, um, of that disease, but this is where it definitely will help us. Um, after the stenosis, the velocity drops, but not significantly. That also tells you that it's uh, on the 70% side, not on the 99% side. And you still have a delayed upstroke, but not significant. ECA, uh, interesting, it's high resistance, but you still hold, and this is over 150 centimeter per second. Our criteria is more than 50% ECA stenosis. And my subclavian on this side uh, with a 200 uh, my criteria. So this would be over a 50% uh, subclavian uh, disease. And uh, direction of the vertebral is antegrade. I'm comparing it again. I'm going to play it again. This vertebral is huge. So this is my common carotid. And this is a huge vertebral artery. And this is a tremendous velocity. So this is where a huge vertebral with this velocity um, definitely helping out the uh, other side. And this is, again, um, we have to call it a stenosis, but this is a potential collateral pathway. So the left vertebral uh, has a huge uh, role of uh, feeding not just the retrograde uh, vertebral artery on the right side, but uh, most likely is going to, again, uh, contribute uh, for the anterior uh, circulation and the posterior circulation as well. So that vertebral increased velocity. And finally, uh, we have one more exam. And here's my flow volume, which is on the left side is four, uh, four, six. So definitely four times more uh, of flow is coming up on, on, on this side. So next, after we did a uh, carotid ultrasound, uh, we did a TCD, and what you're going to see on the TCD is, again, uh, we did the uh, ophthalmic artery first, and when we do the ophthalmic artery first, we, we're placing the probe uh, on the closed eye. Uh, you see that the probe is placed on the closed eyelid, and the ophthalmic artery uh, has minimal positivity, but it's endograde. This is the siphon, the lower resistance area, but again, minimal positivity compared to the left side. has a very good uh, positivity, almost too good. Uh, the high resistance is almost continuous, lots of diastolic flow in the eye and in the siphon. And then we'll compare the middle cerebral artery. So again, we are marching. Uh, you see the depth uh, here is 65. So the 65 depth on the right side is probably the origin of the middle cerebral artery. Then we marching every uh, five uh, millimeters or a centimeter. So now it's 55, somewhere here. Uh, that blunted signal, uh, velocity-wise, it's a 50 normal mean flow velocity. Interesting, the positivity index in this case it shows that it's a decreased PI value. The PI value should be normal between 0 0.6 and 1.2. So that is, again, another objective, beautiful number to tell you that this is a low resistance and abnormal uh, waveform uh, in a middle cerebral artery. So this is now the distal MCA. So again, we march from proximal to 65 to 50. I know we are here at a depth of 45. After the MCA, here's my ACA in a protocol at the bifurcation, and there's one more. And here's my PCA. So I'm pointing back, and I intercepted the PCA somewhere right here. 
So when the PC is turning away is blue, so that is why I'm getting a blue signal. And another nice thing is that the PC is always running together with this Rosenthal vein. So that strong green signal is a venous signal. This is why it's non-positile. And the positivity, it's in my PCA. So again, immediately you see the improved and the different shape of waveform that this PCA is coming from a different vessel bed than my MCAs. Cool? So this is your carotid system, anterior circulation. Here's your posterior circulation with a good positivity. So the good positivity is coming from your left vertebral because your right uh, vertebral uh, is going to be reversed. And here's a huge difference uh, that you see the shape of the waveform uh, on the uh, left MCA, proximal left MCA, mid and distal MCA. Beautiful strong signal that is when you're really in the middle of the vessel That's the best laminar flow that you see the whole uh, waveform just uh, filled up and again your M mode is beautiful continuous And this is when you are definitely at the really distal at the depth of 40 so from your probe it's uh, 40 uh, millimeters and here's uh, how you read the depth how you read the mean flow velocity and your PI values I'm kind of ignoring the rest of those uh, busy numbers. Um, I just need to pay attention to those three. ACA, interestingly enough, my AC is increased. So when you compare the middle cerebral flow and the ACA being higher, that one of my easy indication I will call a flow diversion. Flow diversion meaning that my ACA is sending collateral to the other side. That's why it's higher velocity. My MCA is only 40. This is 80. So that telling me that that AC on the left side is carrying flow from left to right. So this is a potential collateral. And that potential collateral has a brewery. So that brewery, what you see is a flow gap. In systole, that's the turbulence, what you see in that vessel at the depth of 70. And that brewery is there. And then uh, a little bit distal, the brewery disappears. And here comes the posterior circulation. So again, how we expected, the vertebral is definitely red um, and uh, high resistance. So this is, again, uh, um, interesting that you see an antegrade uh, basilar when, again, you're doing the right side of the vertebral, the head turn to the left, and a little bit of chin down one over. And you see the whole basil is blue. So I want you to remember this image because um, everything is going to be red in a moment. And all the way um, to the tip of the basil, everything is blue. So now we're going to the left side. And uh, when you do the left side, the head turn to the right and chin down. I hope uh, you guys remember the chin down. This is my favorite Chinese soup, chin down. Uh, the maneuver is kind of helps you to really open up the posterior circulation space and, and that uh, how we see that vertebral basilar space and we are cross insonating. The two vertebral, those two three millimeters so close that even from a left side you are catching the right side that's why it's red but the sad part is you're not catching just on the vertebral but the entire basilar is red now. So you, this is when the vertebral, and you see no blue at all, but when the head turned to the right, looks like uh, we are losing a potential uh, dominant left vertebral, and you have a provoked uh, retrograde uh, basilar system. And you can see the basilar is all the way uh, from a tip is red, and this is where you see, again, just turning the head results in a different uh, flow direction. So next, uh, I would like to take you to the operating room. Um, um, in the operating room, we're going to fix uh, uh, both of them. Uh, we're going to fix the 70-99% uh, left carotid disease, and we're going to fix also our, our uh, uh, innominate stenosis as well. So you can see in my baseline, here's my right side, here's my left side. I try to insulate kind of similar depth. So again, the depth of anywhere between 50 to 60 guarantees my MCA. You can see my baseline, the same delayed systolic upstroke velocity-wise, definitely less flow on the right side than on the left. But the left side has good systolic upstroke.
So this is my baseline. And I want you to remember this waveform because at the end, we hope that we have a better waveform on both sides. So what you see here, we started the procedure on the left side. We are doing a left uh, carotid stenting. And you see the embolization on the left side. And you see how the left side emboli sometimes sneaking to the other side. And when you balloon, you see that how the non-positive flow, you still remain some flow uh, in that middle cerebrosary and did not affect the flow on the right side. So the right side still getting that beautiful flow from the posterior circulation from that left vertebral. So this is telling me that if my ACA goes out, you still have a tremendous posterior circulation flow uh, helping with collaterals. And this is again just a lone ballooning, interestingly enough. Why are you ballooning on the left side? You see emboli on the right side. Cool. So you pay attention to both hemispheres because, again, what you can tell that this blue is going across and this is how it ends up in the right MCA. So while you're working and releasing your balloon, you see the immediate improvement of the waveform. Pay attention to the PI values and the mean flow velocities improvement right away. It shows we are done with the left side. I will to, um, pay attention to, let's do something on the right side. So when we switch to the right side, we see uh, these embolization again, all this previous image, just a final contrast injection. And in the contrast, when you have, uh, again, uh, uh, a little bit of air, it shows up on both sides at the same time. So interestingly enough, uh, we start on the right side. And you see the right side, when even a catheter or anything in, then you see uh, that you have few emboli heart rate is changed so we're paying attention also to the heart rate so that's a body cardiac in the same time you see the changes so it's not unilateral but bilateral changes that's how you pick up these heart heart rate changes on both sides and again we're working on the right side that you see those embolization and here comes the embolization uh, more emboli and here comes a stent so when we stand and uh, just the contrast uh, confirmation, you will see immediately the flow change. And here's the flow change. So the blunted waveform gets systolic upstroke in a moment you deflate your balloon. And the stent is placed, and this is the happiest moment that again, uh, both sides uh, have beautiful systolic upstroke. We fixed uh, with one uh, surgery uh, definitely on, on both middle cerebral arteries shows that the proximal disease is gone. You have a beautiful systolic upstroke on, on both sides. So with this happy ending, uh, you, I'm sure, would like to see a follow-up uh, duplex. So let's see the follow-up duplex. And you're not going to believe your eyes when you're going to see my follow-up duplex. So my follow-up duplex is going to show you unbelievable, beautiful systolic upstroke in the uh, common carotid artery. Remember that blunted, barely positive waveform? Now, after successful stent placement in immediate artery, you have a gorgeous, gorgeous upstroke. So this is, again, with a minimal disease um, in the bulb. A systolic upstroke, gorgeous flow is gorgeous and we don't have any stenosis on the ECA or in the ICA on the right side and hoping to see the lovely vertebral and that is the beauty. So you already see that the vertebral going to the same direction that my carotid, all to the sneak peek that I saw that my vertebral artery has a different color than the vein. So when you see those two colors already, those are really calming that you really want to see those red, blue, red, blue as um, these two signals. And again, uh, the happy moment is here that you know the color shows anti-grade flow in the vertebral, but you want to see that vertebral. 
and that's the shape of the vertebral waveform. Um, I've seen better shapes, but this is at least an antograde after the retrograde uh, uh, flow direction. And uh, you just see a few more, and I think that's the beauty. Uh, see, the, uh, you need to notice how we're changing the scale on this side. So the angle direction while you're insonating coming from right to left, you know, because the vessel is going this way, and uh, now we switched uh, the rhombus and uh, now it's going to right to left and with an uh, uh, inverted uh, color box you see the flow direction. So on the left side um, we're going to see again, um, oh, before we go to the left here is the confirmation of the subclavian uh, waveforms definitely with a little bit delayed but it's integrated. Uh, and it's under 200, so that's a good subclavian. So on the left side, I see beautiful systolic upstroke, um, and these are my normal uh, flow pattern. To the next is I would like to see what is my uh, vessel doing here. And here is a still stenothic uh, internal uh, carotid artery. So. Um, after the NGO, hopefully we'll fix the, that side as well. And the stenosis on the left side is still there. So the next step is that we're going to fix that left uh, internal carotid artery uh, stenosis. I want to see the vertebral flow. So remember that the vertebral was flowing 300 centimeter per second. After uh, fixing the right side, the vertebral artery velocity tremendously went down. So this is why it's not a stenosis. So that is, again, uh, was just a path of the main collaterals uh, was feeding uh, the whole brain. So I'm just extremely proud of these pictures because, again, uh, this is just uh, one of those uh, quality images that we see. The left subclavian is still uh, with more than 50%. So the remaining two vessels, again, when you find one vessel disease, it doesn't matter the other vessels are healthy, uh, that you're going to see uh, uh, the left internal carotid uh, and the left subclavian still need our attention. Well, I hope uh, you guys uh, enjoyed uh, these cases and you learned something about uh, posterior circulation. I did have another four or five cases for you lined up. Um, fortunately, I'm just going to close it for today. Um, that was our vertebral subclavian uh, story. I do not see any questions. So um, this is really hard to uh, see or um, just a quick reference again. What I want to close with today is, let me show you my last slide. So I just want to close today that um, uh, please uh, do check the pulse, check the blood pressure, Pay attention to the waveform, and if you see any, any abnormal waveform, do the hyperemia test. Blood pressure cuff on the affected side, and pump, uh, you feel the pulse, pump it over systole. You don't need to see the number, and just quickly remove it, so not deflating it. So that would be my hyperemia test and uh, my teaching points and take home message. Please be safe and uh, keep coming back to our teaching uh, seminars. Our recording uh, will be available on the YouTube channel. Thanks again, and see you next month. Bye.